everybody, I am Net Nursing Prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Tay-Sachs disease. So let's get into it. So this is a genetic disorder. This is inherited from both of the parents and it's a mutation of the hexagene. So there is an absence of the enzyme needed to break down gangliosides. Gangliosides are fatty substances. And what happens is if they don't get broken down, they start to build up to toxic levels. And what happens when they build up to toxic levels is they cause damage to nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. Because it is a genetic disorder, our big risk factors are going to be genetics, right? Your parents, who your parents are. So certain populations of people are at higher risk to be carriers and to pass this down. So those groups include Ashkenazi Jewish people, the Amish, especially the Amish in Pennsylvania, and the Cajun community in Louisiana. There are three forms of Tay-Sachs disease, infantile, juvenile, and then late onset, sometimes also referred to as adult. Um, the one you probably know the most about or are learning the most about in your pediatrics course will of course be the infantile one. That's the most common one. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down all three forms so you can learn a little bit more about each. The infantile form is the more common form, and we're going to start seeing symptoms of this develop around three to six months of life. So what symptoms are we looking for? Things like an exaggerated moral reflex, so that startle reflex is going to be exaggerated. They're going to be hypotonic, so like floppy and weak and limp muscles. Um, and then they could start experiencing myoclonic jerks, so kind of um, involuntary movements. Okay. As they get a little bit older, ages 6 to 10 months, they're going to start progressing to get worse. So we're going to have decreased eye movement. They're not going to be meeting those milestones that uh, the baby without Tay-Sachs would be. Or maybe they've met milestones in the past, something like sitting up unassisted. Now they're not going to be able to do those things. They're going to lose. They're going to regress in those milestones. Lack of attentiveness, cherry red spots in the eyes. I put a box around it because if there was ever a hallmark symptom, that's what it is, okay? So, of course, an eye doctor is going to be the one to officially diagnose this, but this is something we would look for in these babies, is these cherry red spots in their eyes. They'll have decreased movement, and then this is usually around the time when they will start to develop seizures. As they get older, around a year and a half, 18 months, their head size is going to start to increase. And then at two years, they're going to start having trouble swallowing. So what this is telling us is their brain is no longer functioning properly. I mean, it never really was, right? Uh, we've been progressively getting worse and worse this entire time. But now we're really starting to see it. So loss of brain function and eventually between the ages of two and four years old they usually pass away. The number one cause of death in these babies though is pneumonia but that's of course related to all these other symptoms and things they're having going on so their brain is not functioning properly. They might even become unresponsive or in a coma at this time okay and then eventually um, it will lead to uh, passing away. The second form, which is less common, is the juvenile form. So this begins during childhood, and these patients have a longer life expectancy. They can survive even into those teenage years. So what are some symptoms they're going to present with? They're going to have behavioral problems. They're going to be having those seizures, loss of vision and speech, decreased control over their movements, their body movements, a decline in their mental functioning, and then eventually a decline in their overall responsiveness, and then frequent respiratory infections. So you can kind of see how some of these symptoms are very similar to the infantile form, with that decrease in that motor functioning, unresponsiveness, and then eventually the pneumonia or those respiratory infections occurring. And then the very rare form is late onset or adult tay sachs um, This one, unlike the other two, doesn't have to impact their life expectancy. So an adult who is diagnosed might live a normal life, might live a normal lifespan. 
They're going to have similar symptoms though. So that muscle weakness, they're going to have tremors or even muscle spasms. They're going to lose coordination and have issues with their ability to speak and then eventually their ability to swallow. And since this is a genetic disorder, the diagnosis is a blood test, genetic testing. That's how we're going to know. When it comes to treatment and our nursing interventions for these patients, we have to remember there is no cure for this disease. Um, it's going to be more focused on things like supportive measures, comfort measures, um, ensuring that they have a good quality of life and preventing complications like those respiratory infections. That's going to be our focus. So things we can do. We can give medications, right, to help with those seizures or antibiotics to help with those infections. Um, good respiratory care. Eventually, when they start to lose their ability to swallow, they're going to probably need a feeding tube, so enteral nutrition, and then maybe even later on, TPN. Because it's affecting the muscles and their movement, right? So physical therapy and occupational therapy are going to be really helpful for these patients, as well as speech therapy, because again, the loss of the coordination of the muscles, the swallowing issues, so speech therapy is going to be really helpful with that. And then these children, when they have it as a child or an infant, they have issues with uh, their senses, right? So sensory stimulation is going to be really helpful. Little things like little noises, little things that make noises or shiny objects or things that can get their attention, right? Because they have that lack of attentiveness. They don't follow things with their eyes as it gets worse, right? So trying to give some sort of sensory stimulation to them, that's going to be important too. But again, no cure, supportive and comfort, that's going to be our goals for treatment. These are our nursing interventions for these patients. And that's Tay-Sachs disease. I hope you found this video helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.